It's happening. War in Europe. The breakdown starts now. Good evening and welcome to The Breakdown. I'm Tara Setmayer. This is the Rick Wilson. And um, Rick, I cannot believe we're actually saying that there's a war happening in mm-hmm. Europe right now. It's there's happening. A- the invasion started last night. Putin is invading a sovereign country. And uh, here we are. You know, Tara, we are at a moment in our history where for the first time since... 1945, we have seen the possibility of a global conflict that could emerge from an authoritarian ruler invading a democratic neighbor. It is, it, we have never been closer to, to something scaling up in a way that is enormously dangerous, not only to this country, but to the world. Let's be real about this. Last night, Vladimir Putin made an elliptical threat about using nuclear weapons on the battlefield. That's right. He has he has moved into the Ukraine in a five or six front war. He has caused enormous civilian and military damage. But I will say there's one thing we should be proud of right now, Tara, and that is that the world has allied behind Ukraine. That's right. Almost every nation in this world stands with Ukraine. Almost every group in this world stands with Ukraine. The people backing Putin's invasion of a of a, a democratic neighbor, Iran, North Korea, Donald Trump, the Republican Party. I like being on the side of a big, broad coalition that has shown strength and determination and energy today to make this campaign of Putin's a costly and fatal mistake for Russia. And it will it was going to take things worked at the at the G7 level, at the NATO level, at the UN level, at the global level. It's going to require leadership across the board to make these sanctions and this economic war that Russia's decided to get, to get into to make it cost them more than they could have ever imagined. It's also going to take NATO's structure and, and, and the U.S. helping Ukraine with supplies, with weapons, with intelligence to push back against the Russians. Because I'll tell you one thing we've seen today. The Ukrainian people are fighting and fighting hard. And if Donald Trump doesn't understand that Ukraine is, is going to be Afghanistan part two, if he keeps pushing, he's mistaken. These are people where there are 60 and 70 year old men out there in the field now shooting Russians. God bless them. That's right. And, and 100%. And, you know, I, I, I've seen that even on social media, the, the hashtags, I stand with Ukraine, um, you know, we've done work here at the Lincoln Project to demonstrate our alliance with Ukraine and the importance of this battle, because it's not only an attack on Ukraine, it's an attack on Western democracy. And we have a great guest tonight to talk to us about the um, impact of this type of authoritarianism. Friend of the show, Ruth ben Giat. She's a historian. She wrote the fabulous book, Strong Men. She's going to be joining us in a few minutes and to talk about the context of all of this, because they're there's precedent for it. We've been here before. And I, I think it's important for people to understand what they're seeing. Rick, I was watching um, CPAC today. Okay, that's I'm something sorry. else that's going on. And we're going to talk about CPAC next week. But right. I turned it on just for the hell of it to see what was happening. My husband came from downstairs and said, are you watching that Russia television TV, uh, station again? <laughs> He thought what he was listening to was RT. Of course. That's how bad the Republicans are on this issue. That is how absurd they sound, how treacherous and treasonous they sound. And this is all after Joe Biden came out today. We're not even 24 hours into the into a hot war happening now in, in Europe. Joe Biden comes out today definitively with the, the tougher sanctions. Mm-hmm. And to your point, reiterated the the world the the modern world is behind ukraine and not behind russia and what do republicans do what does fox news do they come out do you know what was trending today on twitter Mm. 25th amendment 
And I thought to myself, oh, they must be talking about the insanity of Donald Trump over the last couple of days. No, the Fox News and uh, Newsmax and right wing crazies tried to get 25th Amendment trending about Joe Biden. Before we bring calling Ruth him weakness, call, yeah. I mean, call, just saying, claiming that he's in dis displaying weakness. I want to show the ad that we yeah. put out. You yeah. want to talk about weakness? Take yeah. a look. What's wrong? Biden has not offered the leadership to push back. Joe Biden is not going toe to toe with Putin. He's getting run over by Putin. Putin can smell Biden's weakness a mile off. The administration basically uh, is for weakness. weakness. From the United States and from our president. Weak words, muddled messaging. The Russians understand strength and power. No, but think of it. Here's a guy who's very savvy. I know him very well. But here's a guy that says, you know, uh, I'm going to declare a big portion of Ukraine independent. He used the word independent. And we're going to go out and we're going to go in and we're going to help keep peace. You got to say that's pretty savvy. It was only Donald Trump who knew how to use all the levers in order to make sure that Putin wasn't on the march. But as soon as Donald Trump's gone, hey, let's just go marching in. I went in yesterday and there was a television screen and I said, this is genius. I said, how smart is that? And he's going to go in and be a peacekeeper. That's the strongest peace force. We could use that on our southern border. That's the strongest peace force I've ever seen. There were more army tanks than I've ever seen. They're going to keep peace all right. You know, Tara, where, where, where a lot of those things, those quotes from Trump last for that from that clip, from a clip at Mar-a-Lago where he continued the same line of reasoning and from a clip with Laura Ingram last night. You know where they're airing right now, Tara? Russian TV. That's you know what right. They, you're, you're, what they're doing with them? They're saying, look, the great Donald Trump approves of our invasion. So this is an example of a, of a former president, once again, so far out of the bounds, so far off the rails, so far in the pocket of Vladimir Putin, and so, and so absurdly obsessed with his own ego about his relationship with Putin, that he's willing to damage the American interests in the world. He's willing to damage this country. And before we bring Ruth on, I, ha I need to have a two minute rant. A one yeah, minute. Yeah. You'll see a lot of clips from the Fox News people, from the crazies, from the Republicans who are out there pro-Putin uh, shills right now. You will see nothing more repellent than Steve Bannon and Eric Prince on Steve Bannon's War Room podcast comparing American and NATO troops to Nazis. They threaten Ukraine or they threaten Russia just like the Nazis by being in Europe. Let me tell you something. If this was a just and fair country, those motherfuckers would be dragged from their studio and horsewhipped in the street. If this was a fair and just country, they would be arrested because they are active participants in a global conspiracy with Vladimir Putin to bring this country to its knees. I could not have been more disgusted. I could not have been more repulsed. I could not have been more engaged in wanting to make sure that we break the back of these kind of people in this country, that we move them out of the political discourse so far that they can rant outside the back of a fucking Greyhound station, but they can never again be seen or carried for their podcast or, or carried on a TV network because they are truly the worst the worst fucking traitors I've ever seen. And again, I know I'm supposed to watch my language lately, but these guys deserve every ounce of public approbation they can find. I swear, do not walk in front of my vehicle, Steve Bannon. Do not. You will be a greasy roadkill. Proverbially. It's proverbially. <laughs> That's the word. Yes, um, proverbially. Yes, proverbially. In the metaphorical sense. Yes, yes. I, I've got your back, Rick Wilson. Um, amen. I mean, I, there's nothing more to say about that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I saw that clip, and uh, these are very, very bad people. Bad people. But, but yet, they are getting a, a platform, and they are amplified. People go on the, on Steve Bannon's show, uh, mainstream yeah. Republicans now, it's mm -hmm. a stop. And it's like, you know, like Rush Limbaugh used to be back in the day. It's show insane. Where the, where the owner of the show, where the talent of the show, once again said that American and NATO troops were as threatening to Russia as Nazis. Mm -hmm. You don't compare American troops to Nazis. You just don't do it. 
Well, they're taking the language straight from Russian propaganda. <laughs> We've been watching, you, were t- you and I were talking about this earlier. We were both watching Russia TV because uh, I wanted to see how they were covering this. And it is a, uh, it is not, it's an alternate reality. Yeah. What they're it saying, the propaganda is insane. It, 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 yeah. It makes Fox look like, 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 like Reader's Digest. Yeah, yeah. And they've been using the Nazi language. They're claiming that the Ukrainians also are committing genocide like Nazis. Julia Davis, who was our guest on Tuesday, was talking about that as well. So this is a theme that Americans are taking, piggybacking off of Russian disinformation. It's craziness. But it's part of the authoritarian playbook, which is a great segue into tonight's guest. Let's bring in... Ruth, Ruth ben Giat. she's a friend of the show. We've had her before. She's amazing. Hey, she's written an amazing book called Strongman. I encourage everyone to read it if you want a fantastic chronology and history lesson of Strongman in the 20th century and the parallels to what we see today. And she's got a great substack called Lucid. Ben, Ruth ben Giat, welcome back. Great to be here, even under such circumstances. It's yeah. a lot, right? Um, and especially for someone like you who's a historian who has studied um, how these things have gone in the past, uh, I can only imagine that it weighs even more heavily on you. You saw some of uh, what we showed earlier today. I want this, this idea that a former president is siding with an enemy, not only of our country, but of demo- Western democracy, is tough to comprehend. It's reprehensible. I want to show another ad that Lincoln Project did and get your response to this. You know, the people of Crimea, from what I've heard, would rather be with Russia than where they were. Do you like Vladimir Putin's comments about you? Sure. When people call you brilliant, it's always good, especially when the person heads up Russia. Yeah. Well, I mean, it also is a person that kills journalists, political al- I mean, uh, political opponents, yeah. and uh, invades countries. And invades countries. Obviously, uh, that uh, it would be a concern, would it not? He's running this country, and at least he's a leader. You know, unlike what we have in this country. Yeah, but again, he kills journalists that don't agree with him. Well, I think uh, our country does plenty of killing, also, Joe. So. Putin's a killer. A lot of killers. We got a lot of killers. Why well, you think our country's so innocent? No, no. Think of it. You know, it's Russia after all. Somebody said, "Are you at all offended that he said nice things about you?" I said, "No." In all fairness to Putin, you're saying he killed people. I haven't seen that. I don't know that he has. Have you been able to prove that? Do you know the names of the reporters that he's killed? I had a uh, call with President Putin and congratulated him on the victory, his electoral victory. <laughs> I want to thank him because we're trying to cut down on payroll. We'll save a lot of money. I like him because he called me a genius. You know, the people of Crimea, from what I've heard, would rather be with Russia than where they were. (laughs) Exactly. Uh, Okay. Excuse me. Now I'm losing my voice. So, um, you know, this is par for the course because Trump has a very long history of not only uh, admiring the Russians, but being involved with the Russians. And um, I interviewed somebody for my newsletter, Lucid, who works on uh, Casey Michelle, read a book on American kleptocracy, who... Uh, reminded me that Trump, his whole business model, wasn't just licensing his name abroad, he's on the supply side of the international flows of illicit money, because through his real estate, he allows Russian Mm -hmm. clients to launder their money. So he's not just an admirer of autocrats, he's not just locked in with Putin um, and and other Russians. It's actually... And then there's all the funding through Deutsche Bank. You know, it, there's he's locked into the Russian uh, kleptocracy in ways that we don't fully know yet. Well, his sons but, bragged about it, right? Don that they have Russian money. Yes. Yeah, so they're so so this it's it's actually um, this is a lot for me to say too. Staggering that this man who is a criminal in so many ways, so many ways, was the president of the United States. 
-hmm. and degraded the office. Now, the other thing I have to say is, so we, we can only expect that from Trump. And of course, it was highly revealing that his first pick for Secretary of State was Rex Tillerson, who had received an order of friendship from Putin, uh, who worked for Exxon and, again, is part of this kind of whole world of Western enablers, people who do business. Mm -hmm. But what is really shocking is that the, now, after four years of uh, Trump imposing this authoritarian discipline on the GOP, you have many more people, and this is part of the loyalty, the part of the talking points now, who've come out, even a former CIA head, Mike Pompeo, who are now openly pro-Putin. And right. I feel like, yes, we had the Rex Tillersons, we had these people, Trump's always been like that, but this is another um, measure of the sea change that we've lived through, that, that all these people are just, no problem, let's back Putin in a war. You know, Ruth, you, you mentioned the, the 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 authoritarian discipline Trump imposed in the GOP. In history, and I, I think people don't really appreciate this much, that can happen in a culture very quickly. It can change a culture very quickly. Um, you know, yeah. in Germany and in, in, in pre-Soviet Russia, cultures can change at the hands of an authoritarian almost overnight. And I, I think that's one of those examples where where his, the way he's radically transformed the way Republicans, who for generations did not favor Russian intervention in Europe or anywhere else, yeah. suddenly are like, yeah, Putin, no problem. Yeah, and it's all the more extraordinary, and it's going to take us, we're, we're already digesting it, we, we're living it, but that this happened in a democracy. <laughs> all of this coward, it, cowardice, and Tara, you and I have talked about it, and all of this... Um, compliance and complicity happened. We're not in Saddam Hussein's Iraq. So if you, if you don't go along with it, you end up in prison or killed. It's all voluntary. So actually everything that's happened with Donald Trump and the GOP is a lesson in like the psychological dynamics of like leader follower relationships of corruption. That's why I put, I added a corruption chapter to my book mm -hmm. because you cannot understand. And I meant moral corruption as well as financial corruption. And it happened in a, in a place that was still an open society with a pluralistic media. It's, it's absolutely staggering. Mm -hmm. And you give an example also in your book, in your, in the, I think it's a new epilogue, um, where you talk about with Putin um, and the fire hose of lies. I, I often talk about the fire hose of fuckery happening with the Republicans. <laughs> That's <And> better. So, <laughs> so in the, but you, you were um, a, a little more um, gracious in, in the terminology, but you were talking about how this is straight out of the authoritarian playbook because of the domestic situation happening and how these uh, authoritarians react to it, it's oftentimes they're, they become even more repressive. Can you talk about that? Yeah. So the firehood of falsehood, which is the, the, I didn't, I can't take credit for that nice term. It's uh, these uh, specialists for the Rand Corporation. It's a, it's a report from the Rand Corporation, but it refers to uh, the fact that, you know, in 21st century, you don't just do censorship. You don't just shut things down. You don't just say no one can criticize the leader. And we have all that. Putin even passed laws that you can't criticize and can't satirize them. But the new thing is that you try and make, uh, you, you try and degrade the notion of the truth altogether. So the firehood of falsehood isn't just lies. It's also conspiracy theories. Hello. It's rumors. It's half truths. It's maybe truths. Um, and so the point is not just to shut down critics because those are silenced. Alexei Navalny sitting in jail, but it's to confuse people and ultimately lead them to conclude that you can't really know the truth. And that's very handy. So, for example, what's going on now that Russia is this big aggressor trying to uh, trying to you know, portray itself as the victim. And there's a very old thing about Russia victimized by the West and that's Putin's talking about it constantly. But if you're trying to confuse people because it makes no sense that a, a Dmitry Peskov, his spokesman says just baldly, oh, um, <laughs> right. we've, Russia has never, you know, been an aggressor to anyone. Right. And 
And so the context is, and, and Russians have been living with this for 20, 20 years yeah. um, right. to make people think, I, I, I can't even follow all this. It makes no sense. And ultimately thus to become passive and resigned in the face of everything the Kremlin and RT tells them. Yeah, I think that, I think that's the, that we underestimate the, the degree to which media control mm -hmm. uh, in, in Russia has been, you know, there was a brief flowering of chaotic media right after the fall of the Berlin Wall. And there were about three or four years where Russian media was really interesting and, and, and digging into corruption and everything else. And now it's, you know, it, it's, it's all the party line all the time, which is, again, one of the things in the toolbox of authoritarians where there's going to be one or two stations that always say the same thing and, and, and allow his supporters to echo that message over and over again. It's almost like there's something in America like that. I'm trying to <laughs> well, hmm. well, you know, we're all so exhausted, but we have been, um, because Trump is a highly skilled propagandist, but he's an information warrior. He has imported the Russian information warfare playbook. Mm -hmm. And we have been besieged and we've been at the, at the other end of that fire hose of falsehood and half truths. And that's the Trump model. And I want, I would like people to recognize the Russian context for this because that is why we're all so exhausted. And it's been, you know, it's like sometimes it's meant because I'm a historian, I'm trying to like, you know, look at the past to look at the present, but also somehow be already looking at it as though I were already writing the history of it. And it's been interesting to see the media is had is scrambling to deal with this fire hose of falsehood. And it took them years to say Trump lied. And it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's very mm -hmm. interesting being, it's very difficult to be in the thick of this. Go ahead, Rick. Oh yeah. Thank you. <laughs> uh, you know, Ruth, one of the things I've been thinking about the last couple of days is if Putin doesn't, if Putin doesn't come out of this looking as if he's the conquering hero in a certain period, most, most authoritarians, most dictators, they have to keep winning. They have to, they always have to keep looking like yeah. they're ahead of the other people, like they're ahead of the curve, ahead of the game. What do you think of this the, the, today? You know, two things happened in Russia today that really were, were interesting. He was forced to sit the author the, all the oligarchs down and basically pitch this to them. And he got a little bit of very mild, but he got actual Good. pushback, like, don't wreck the world economy, okay, boss? <laughs> and there were also tens of thousands of people on the streets tonight in Novosibirsk, in St. Petersburg, in Moscow, in places across Russia, actively protesting this war, which is something I think is remarkable given the risk that they know that anyone who stands up too loud and too and too obviously against Putin takes. They know they're going to get killed, or they're going to get imprisoned, or they're going to get poisoned, or they're going to get disappeared. So I, I think those two things speak to me of a certain fragility to Putin right now. That if he doesn't doesn't have you know a stunning victory, that he may be in some trouble. What do you think about that? Oh yeah, I I um I, like each day seems like five days. I I said that on MSNBC at Ali Belshi the the minute we started hearing about this. So here's how I see it. Whereas he, you know, even before he when he started massing his his all his you know fearsome military machine looks very looks very strong. I thought because I followed in my book the trajectory of these guys, this is actually a sign of weakness. Because here here's how I see it. Um, he's kind of at the peak of his power and, and he knows inside that it's not sustainable because a klept he's got a kleptocracy and they're not sustainable over the long run. And he, the only people who had such a fully realized kleptocracy didn't end well. That was Gaddafi and Mobutu. Right. So when, when, yeah, when you're a nice company to be in, right. Um, when you're at that point, and you realize it's all downhill and you can only survive by putting your uh, viable, you know, rivals in jail like Navalny, more and more repression, more and more disinformation. Mm -hmm. you, you get worried and you do two things. One is you start thinking about, you get these fantasies of grandeur and you become obsessed with your place in history. Right. And mm -hmm. so that's what Putin's talking about. He wants to be, you know, a, a form of the Stalin and, and you know, revive the glory of the Soviet empire. But 
you you also um, start to do risky things. And that's because he has been, they all have these things called, I wrote in the book, like inner sanctums, where right. they're family members and cronies and flatterers. And over time, he's been there 22 years, he, you don't really have good intel anymore. And Fiona Hill was uh, in an op-ed mm -hmm. and she was saying, well, maybe he's not getting such good intelligence. Maybe people are just telling him how great he is. And that's mm -hmm. when they make mistakes. So I have the example of Mussolini and then there's Hitler. They overreach. They get, they act out of hubris and out of fear and they do, they make mistakes. And so that's how I see this actually. You're not the first person to say that actually. There are some others yeah. who are thinking that perhaps this is an overreach yes. and, and this is, um, it, it's not, it may not go the way Putin thinks it's going to go. Um, the world is a very different place than it was back the last time we had a, uh, <clears throat> a sovereign country in Europe invaded, but still this is a problem. Um, how do we, in our final minutes with you, how do we stop this march of autocracy? Because mm. it, it, it's, it's metastasizing in a way that I don't think the American people fully grasp. They still think, well, that's over there. But this is something that we really need to pay attention to because we're seeing it metastasize here as well. And I don't know that the through line is being, um, you know, that that's, that's being connected yet here in America. How do we stop this? Yeah, and you, Lincoln Project has been absolutely crucial in getting to people, uh, to trying to get to people to, sh to shift their frame. And that's the whole point of all the work I've been doing is to try and familiarize people with, you know, before I think about like some years ago, nobody was using the word authoritarianism or coups. I remember when I decided to put coups in my book, I was like, oh, no one's going to care in America about coups. Like, should I really put it in? Um, but we're a bit challenged on this because what's happening abroad is in right now, there are elections uh, in a lot of places that have autocrats this year. And in Serbia and in Hungary, the opposition is banding together against uh, mm -hmm. Orban and Vucic. But that's because those are multi-party systems. We've got this issue where we only have the two you know, huge parties and one of them has become a far-right authoritarian party. So there's no, we can't do that, right? Um, the other thing, which I was really happy to hear, you know, that's going on with Biden, from President Biden today is you have to go after their money and their money is not held in Russia. Their money is held in offshore, you know, the offshore finance network. And that's very difficult for some people because the people who manage the money, the wealth managers, international law firms, they're located in D.C., in New York and in London. <laughs> And they consider them, they, they live with the benefits of freedom, but they're the ones, they're enablers. And those people are very powerful and they don't, they're not so into, uh, you know, ruining uh, the party for themselves. But right. the way to do it is sanctions. Um, and I think there's That's a new right. will in Washington. In fact, even before this mess started, there's a new a bipartisan anti -clep anti-kleptocratic or anti-corruption caucus in Congress. And that's a very good sign. I'll say one thing that we're going to do in the next few days. We're going to make every lobbyist in this country <laughs> who represents Russian business interests for oligarchs, we're going to make them very famous. Thank you. That's to do. I'm a big believer in, uh, in shaming uh, when you have a dire situation like this in calling that's the names. It's very important. It actually is proven to, because people care about their reputation. They care about how they're looked at at the grocery store. That's a very good thing to do. We're That's right. Well, well, thank it, you so much for joining us tonight, Ruth. You were always a favorite. And uh, and uh, we look forward to having you again soon. Thank you so much, Ruth. Pleasure. As, they, as, as the famous Ida B. Well said, in, to right the wrongs, you have to shine the light of truth upon them. Yes, which is uh, what we are doing in this effort, because you have to, and mm -hmm. um, we have to expose what's going on. Otherwise, people can't react to it, and you can't understand why these actions are being taken. So I don't want to hear all this nonsense about President Biden and weakness, okay? Maybe they could have put more sanctions on faster, but what he's doing is the right thing. He, the New York Times had a fantastic article that, it, that explained how long this has been in the works. Mm -hmm. This started back when Biden was in, in Rome 
And it was under the cover of a visit to the Vatican, but he was actually meeting with world leaders preparing for what was going on with Putin in Ukraine right. back in November. So, you know, stop this with this nonsense you know, trying to compare about, about Trump about, to uh, Biden. Uh, well, yeah, you're, exactly. One thing I've noticed here about a lot, a lot of the Republican criticism of, of Biden right now is it's so pro forma. It's so I tired. Know. Most of them are faking it. They don't even trying that hard. I mean, Elise Stefanik today wrote some some 20 year old intern wrote some garbage statement. for today. These people don't believe this. They recognize in a lot in a large measure, the grownups, at least. That international affairs are enormously complicated during any other circumstance, they would have been asking for all the leeway for the president in the world. They would have been a bipartisan alliance. Mm -hmm. A meaningful number of Republicans right now in the Senate are, in fact, opposed to Trump's statement on this. They are opposed to the way that Putin is behaving. But that's you'll hear them. Way, except for a handful of those men and women, will do nothing. That's right. They're more afraid of Donald Trump than they are of Vladimir Putin's tanks rolling through the streets of a European democracy and a U.S. ally. And what does it that say about the them? It is sign of their cowardice, their moral collapse, their weakness, their impotence. It, it, is, it is truly profoundly disgusting. It to is. These people, to watch these people let this go and to pretend, oh, it's Biden's fault, nothing. I mean, and this, and this BS conflation saying, well, Trump didn't invade Ukraine when or Putin didn't invade Ukraine when Trump was there. Yes, you know why? Because Trump took out his fucking laundry. Because Trump shined his shoes. Because Trump promised him in the second in the second administration he'd pull out of NATO. That's right. I mean, they forget they this, me, and they know this. And you know, it's like dollar store conservative historian Rich Lowry. Oh, please. Saying, well, the Trump was crazy. That's why Putin didn't do anything. No. No, a predictable, transactional, boring uh, counterpoint to Vladimir Putin in the universe. This whole this whole moment, it really is one. You know, you keep wondering, you're like, where's the bottom of the Republican Party? Where's the where's the point where they go? We can't abase ourselves. We can't humiliate ourselves anymore. We can't do this anymore. There is no point. Right. We haven't seen it yet. If it hasn't, if it wasn't January 6th and it's not, and it's right. not, uh, you know, it's praising not, Putin well, as a genius while yeah. he's invading, mm -hmm. then yeah, I guess there, there's still, there is no bottom. And I talked to my University of Virginia class today, one of the, um, the guest lectures that I do for my resident scholarship there. And I, we were talking about that and how there is no bottom and how extraordinary that is in modern yeah. politics in the United States that we've never seen anything like this. But uh, I just want to say Mitt Romney was right. He was. <laughs> Mitt Romney was right. And he wrote a great statement where he said, in the 1980s, maybe uh, foreign policy is calling, but nobody was there to pick up the phone. Wait, I got one more group to yell at tonight because I'm yelling at people. <laughs> um, hey, progressives, get your act in, get your shit in order. Back the president, back the play, back the country. It will help you in the end. You don't understand that. Because you're very much obsessed with your own idea of how the world works. Never be on the side of an authoritarian dictator rolling tanks through a democracy. And that, I mean, look, I, I, I'm going to write off Tulsi Gabbard, who is just whatever the fuck She's she the worst. Um, but, you know, AOC and Bernie and the squad and the rest, you know what they could do right now? They could come out in full-throated support of the, of the White House, the administration, because there's no alternative here. Exactly. No What's the end game for them? Get on board or you're going to have the other people back in charge and you're going to be having a president who would have said, eh, I'm going to build Trump Tower Kiev. Oh, so whatever. Invade. Roll the tanks, Bo. That's right. Which is not what any of us want. Yeah. Um, so before we end the show tonight, <clears throat> speaking of heroes, um, I wanted to make sure we got our Black History moment in um, to honor three uh, heroes in the in honor of military service in this country. Three extraordinary Black women who all broke color and gender barriers in the aviation space. Um, Shauna Rochelle Kimbrell, she was the first, uh, she's a lieutenant colonel. She was the first American uh, Black female fighter pilot in history to fly an F-16 for the Air Force. That was in 2000. She flew combat missions in uh, no-fly zones over Iraq. Then we have Vernice Armour 
Vernice Armour, they call her Fly Girl. Um, she's the first Marine Corps officer to fly in combat. She flew AH-1W Super Cobra attack helicopters, pretty badass. Um, she was part of the 2003 invasion of Iraq and served two tours during um, Iraqi freedom. I had the privilege of seeing her speak at an event in New York a couple years ago. She is amazing. And she has a great book out. I believe it's called Fly Girl also. Check that out. And then there's Madeline Swagel. She's the most recent uh, Black female to break a color barrier. She's the first Navy fighter pilot for tactical jets. She graduated from the Naval Academy in 2017, and she flies aircrafts like the F-18 Super Hornet, the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter, which is pretty cool if you've ever seen one in, in flight, and the EA-18 Growler. And her accomplishment comes 19 years after Captain Vernice um, broke the, the barrier with the Marine Corps. So these are extraordinary women that are doing amazing things. And I'm so proud of their service. And we honor them in our Black Thank History you. Month moment, given the state of the, of the world we're in now. All right, folks, um, continue to uh, pray for Ukraine. This is an ongoing situation. And um, I don't know how this ends, Rick, but we will be at the forefront of it, standing for democracy on the right side of history. We will. And I got, I've got i got two asks for our audience tonight. Yeah. Let's who watch this video. Two things I'd love you to do. First off, um, we put out a call today for, to contact Fox News. We, 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 we melted their phone lines today because Lincoln voters kick ass. <laughs> um, there's the last tweet on the Fox News channel. We encourage folks to call them. And make it clear that you're going to ask your cable system to drop them because you don't want to see pro-authoritarian dictator fellation every night by people like Tucker Carlson, Laura Ingram, Sean Hannity, etc. The second thing we're asking folks to do, we tried to get RT to let us run an ad called Old Man. Which we're about to show. We're about to show you Old Man. We would like you to tweet that ad at the Russian, uh, the, the Kremlin MFA. It's Kremlin underscore MFA. That's their Ministry of Foreign Affairs. RT wouldn't run that ad. You know why they wouldn't call us back and, and, and make a deal to run the ad? Because they know they'd get their heads blown off. It is an ad in Russian targeted to a Russian audience. We're, we're trying to get it out on social media as wide as we can because it asks the key question to Russian parents. Do you want your young man to die for this old man? Yes. Um, can we put up the banner of where people can, can tweet? Yeah. Can you say it again, Rick, in it's, case people missed it's, it? It's Kremlin underscore MFA. So at Kremlin underscore MFA, okay. that's who we want folks to tweet this ad that we're about to show you. Tweet it at the Kremlin there at underscore, underscore MFA. MFA. Underscore yeah. MFA. Um, we want you to tweet it at them because I can tell you that following Russian um, media Twitter um, folks like Julie Davis and others, yeah. you see that there is a, a a sense of dread in Russia that their sons are being shipped off and they're being coerced. There, she, there were reports that they're being beaten and coerced into going to the front lines in Ukraine. The Russian people don't want to do this. So this is um, the more that we can stir the pot there and show them and remind them this is really what's going on and this is the man that you are serving, I think it, it has an impact. This is that kind of information warfare, the good kind we were always have an impact. In the head of Donald Trump for the good of the campaign. We want to get in Vladimir Putin's head. We want to make his people start to hate him. We want to do anything we can. And look, it's a small thing, folks. It, it's a small thing. It's a, it's a small ad, but we're trying to do everything we can for the movement around this world for democratic values and democratic freedoms and to resist the authoritarian tide. And you know what? Some days it's the smallest thing. That's you know, right. As they say in, in battle, everybody's one bullet away. <laughs> we want this information warfare bullet to hit that motherfucker. And on that note, we leave you tonight with Old Man. We'll see you next time. В то время, когда путинские войска вторгаются в Украину, чтобы удовлетворить тщеславие старика, каждая русская мать задает себе вопрос: почему мой молодой человек должен умереть за этого старика? 